Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Gracious God, I thank you for uh, for bringing us into this place. I thank you for your word, your word that provides a foundation upon which we can build our lives. I thank you for the prayer that your son taught us to pray. A prayer that we've been centering ourselves on during these weeks of the summer. And I pray, God, that you would just keep us open to what it is that you desire to say to us this morning. I believe it's not accidental that we are here. And I believe, God, that you have a word for all of us in this room this morning. So whether that word comes from my lips or whether that word is in spite of what I say today, God, I pray that it would be heard and received. And I pray that it would become transformative for all of us. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get started this morning, I have a question that I want to ask that that I believe will impact everything that I will say from this point forward in this sermon. And the question is this, how seriously do you take the Bible? I want you to think about that question. How seriously do you take the Bible? How authoritative is it over your life? Now I ask that question because This prayer that we've been focusing on, this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer, um, it's one of the first prayers that that all of us learn uh, after now I lay me down to sleep. I mean, we've been praying this prayer, most of us, many of us in this room, if not most of us, we've been praying this prayer since as early as we can remember praying. But I confess to you this morning that I have grown so familiar to the words of this prayer that it's become more of a, of, a, of a prayer that I just recite from memory in a worship service week after week after week um, and, and not really pay attention to what it is I'm saying. And I don't think I'm alone. But I'll tell you, if I did pay attention, if I did pay attention to the words that I was saying in this prayer, and if I did consider the Bible to be supremely authoritative over my life, then the, 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 con- the, the connection of those two trains would cause me to live my life a lot differently, especially in relation to the petition that we're dealing with in this prayer today. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, at one level, this this statement in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. At one level, these words can be an affirmation of the role of forgiveness in all of our lives. God, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And and, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you that... that, um, that, that over the years, I've not really thought a whole lot about the implication of that statement in the Lord's Prayer as it relates to, to how I live my daily life. I've just prayed the prayer, and it's a part of the prayer. I mean, I've thought this is a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And Jesus came to this earth and died on a cross so that my sins and our sins would be forgiven. So it would make sense then for Jesus to have a word about forgiveness in this prayer that he teaches us to pray. And so I've just taken it like, you know, I'm asking God, to forgive me of my sins and then I'm telling God in this prayer 
aware that I'm going to, to do my part and forgive others and then I just go on. And whether I ultimately forgive or choose not to forgive doesn't really matter. And as I've reflected on that, it's occurred to me that that's kind of like singing Jesus loves me, this I know, and then walking away from that song feeling no differently about your relationship with Jesus than you did before you sang the song. Or it's like singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And just thinking about all the memories that that song stirs up about when you sang it at a particular time in your life or where you sang it or what funeral you heard it at or what person comes to mind when you sing that hymn and your mind just, just centers on that instead of, I'm a wretched sinner and God's grace has saved me. Are you tracking with me on this? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's what Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us as we forgive others. And then when you read what Jesus said in the sentence immediately following his teaching of this prayer, you discover that there is so much more to this statement in the Lord's Prayer than just simply a good word about forgiveness. Do you remember what Jesus said? Matthew 5, four, or Matthew 6, 14 and 15, he said this. He said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I would like to just put a period there and move on, wouldn't you? Jesus didn't. He said, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I believe Jesus meant what he said there. And at the risk of causing some of you in this room today to get pretty uncomfortable, I'm not going to dance around these words today. Because to be honest, God has not allowed me that luxury this week as I've been preparing for this message. St. Augustine called this petition a terrible petition. He pointed out that, that if you pray these words while harboring an unforgiving spirit, then you are actually asking God not to forgive you. Now think about that for a second. Another person said that, that if you pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us while refusing to forgive those who've wronged you, then this prayer that is meant to be a blessing becomes a self-inflicted curse. In that case, you're really saying, oh God, since I've not forgiven my brother, please don't forgive me. It's why Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that great English preacher, said that if you pray the Lord's Prayer with an unforgiving spirit, you have virtually signed your own death warrant. In John Wesley's sermon on this text, he said, while we do not from our hearts forgive our neighbor his trespasses, what, what manner of prayer are we offering to God whenever we utter these words? We're indeed setting God to, at open defiance. We are daring God to do his worst. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. That is, Wesley said in plain terms, don't forgive us at all. We desire no favor at your hands. God, we pray that you will keep our sins in remembrance and that your wrath may abide with us. During one period in his life, uh, John Wesley was a missionary uh, in the American colonies, specifically in the part of our land now that would later become Georgia. And while he was serving as a missionary there, he became acquainted with a General Oglethorpe. And, and General Oglethorpe was, uh, was considered to be a, a very reputable military leader, but he also had a reputation of being a harsh and brutal man. One day he said to John Wesley, he said, I never forgive. At which point, John Wesley responded by saying, then sir, I hope you never sin. Yeah. 
So when we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We're asking God to forgive our sins according to the same standard we use in forgiving other people's sins. Or to put it another way, if you're a Christian, then you will never receive forgiveness for the sins you commit during your Christian walk unless you are ready to extend that same forgiveness to the people who have sinned against you. Ray Steadman says that, that forgiving those who have sinned against us keeps us enjoying unbroken fellowship with the Father and with the Son, which is, of course, the secret to emotional quietness and rest. He says, Jesus is simply saying here that if you're a Christian, then there is no use praying, Father, forgive my sins, if you're holding a grudge against someone else, or burning with resentment, or if you're filled with bitterness, or if you're eating your heart out over some real or imagined wrong that has come to you. It's, it's, it's what Jesus was saying um, in, in, throughout Scripture. I mean, basically, he says, deal with that stuff first. I mean, remember Matthew 5, 24? Jesus says, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and while you're there, you remember that, that a brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there, go then first and be reconciled to that brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. It's that important. And you know, I guess when it's all said and done, if, if we refuse to forgive someone else, we are really withholding from that other person the very grace that has already been shown to us. I mean, it's, it's only because we've already been forgiven the huge debt of our own sins that we're ever able to find the grace to forgive another person who's wronged us. And then I guess, in the final analysis, this is about trust. It's about our trust in God. I mean, to withhold forgiveness from another person is to say that we don't trust that God will take care of us after we offer that forgiveness. John Piper says that holding fast to an unforgiving spirit proves that we do not trust Christ. If we trust him, we will not be able to take forgiveness from his hand for our million dollar debt and withhold it from our ten dollar debtor. Remember the story Jesus told in Matthew 18? He told it in response to a question that, that Peter asked him. Peter came up to Jesus. And, and, you know, Peter, we, Peter we, is always the honest one of the bunch. He walks up to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, is there a limit to how many times I forgive? So, uh, so, so I mean, is, is seven that limit? I mean, you know, you've heard the statement, right? For, um, do me wrong once, you know, it's on me. What, I forget how it goes. How does it go, Daniel? Yeah, shame on, twice shame on me, three times, something, something like that. He, well, he goes, that's why I don't do that sort of stuff. He, he, he goes up to seven. And that's a lot. And I think P Peter was probably feeling pretty generous in offering that number. Is, so is the limit seven in terms of how many times I should forgive? And Jesus says, no, not seven. Seventy-seven times. And then he told a story. He told a story about a king who, who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And so he had this one servant who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. I mean, that's a lot of money, 10,000 bags of gold. And so he brings this servant in knowing that there's absolutely no way in this world that this guy could ever repay him that debt that he owes him. So he brings him in and he demands that he repay. And the guy says, I don't have it. And so the king then orders that the, they, uh, they take this guy and his wife and his children and sell them into slavery until they can then repay the debt that's owed the king. At which point this guy falls on his knees and he begs this king for mercy. He says, just give me some time. Just be patient with me. I promise you, I'll pay it back. And then Jesus said the king took pity on him. And he canceled the debt. And he let him go. That's an amazing gift, isn't it? 
Well, in the very next scene in this story that Jesus told, this guy who's been forgiven this huge debt, he, he leaves the presence of the king and he goes out and he finds one of his fellow servants who owes him a hundred silver coins. And he grabs the guy by the throat and he demands that that guy repay him that hundred silver co coins that he owes him. And the guy, the guy fell to his knees and begged this newly forgiven servant to be patient with him. And he promised him that he would definitely repay those hundred silver coins. But then this new forgiven guy wouldn't accept that. Instead, he had this man thrown into prison until he could repay the debt. Some of the other servants of the king heard about this and they knew what the king had done to this servant that had owed him at one time 10,000 bags of gold. And so they told him about what he had done. And so the king calls this guy in and he says, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And then the king had that servant thrown into jail to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed, which would, as you know, never be able to happen. And then Jesus said this in summary. In Matthew 18, 35, he said, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. It's what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 5, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. So I want to say three things about all of this, and then we'll go. First, given all that I've said so far, I think it's pretty obvious that if you're going to, if you're going to forgive someone who's hurt you in any way, then you've got to take the first step. I mean, if you wait for that person to get right before you ever think about offering that person forgiveness, then it will rarely happen. If you're going to forgive a person who's wrong, you've got to take the first step. Ray Steadman told this story. He said, a man, a man once said to me, I know that I'm a Christian, but, but this so-and-so did this thing to me, and, and I can't forget, I just can't forgive him. And, and Steadman said to him, he said, are you sure that you can't forgive him? And the guy said, no, I can't. He said, I've really tried to forgive this guy, but it just keeps coming back, and I get angry all over again. I, I, just, I just can't forgive him. And so Stedman looks at this guy and he says, you know, I've discovered that, that we oftentimes use the word can't when what we really mean is won't. Is it not possible that, that, that what you're saying is not I can't forgive him, but I won't forgive him? Because if it is really true that you can't forgive this man, then that indicates that you yourself have never been forgiven, that you're only kidding yourself about being a Christian. Well, as you can imagine, that shook this guy up a bit. And he thought about it. And, and then with a rather sheepish, sheepish grin, he looked back at Ray Steadman and he said, well, I guess you're right. I guess it is won't instead of can't. How is it with you? I mean, if you're here this morning and you're struggling with forgiveness in your life, whatever that might look like for you, is it that you can't? Or is it that you won't? This scripture passage today is telling us that as followers of Jesus, we must always step toward forgiveness. Always. But I, you know, I agree, sometimes the offense is huge. Sometimes the pain that comes into our lives as a result of the offense that a person commits to us is crippling in its severity. And even the thought of taking a step toward forgiveness seems absolutely impossible. So if that's where you are, then I want to offer a step that you can take. And that is to pray for those who've hurt you. 
pray for those who have hurt you. It's what Jesus said to do in Matthew 5, right before he taught this prayer in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew 5, 43, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father who's in heaven. You see, the people that Jesus was talking to, they had grown up with, 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 with a way of, of dealing with other people that, that said that you hate your enemy. If somebody hurt you, you hurt them back, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was the way you live your life. Somebody causes you pain, you cause them pain back. But Jesus came to turn this around. And Jesus said, instead of hating your enemy, Jesus said, love your enemy. And pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And I'm going to tell you, I want you to hear this. When you pray for that person who hurt you, sometimes that prayer is a one-way activity. You know? Because your prayers for that person may not change that person ever. You may pray for that person and that person may continue to do the very things that cause you pain in the first place. It's why Peter asked Jesus, okay, Jesus, look, how many times do I forgive? Is there a limit? Yeah, how about seven? And Jesus said, no, there's no limit because it's, it's not about that person. Your prayer your prayers may not change that person, but here's the truth that I do not want you to miss this morning. Your prayers may not change that other person, but your prayers will change you. They will change you. I'm telling you, when you start to pray for that person that's injured you, then most likely those prayers that you offer will be prayed through clenched teeth. You know? God, God, okay, I'm, I'm praying for that person. God, I want your will to be done. If you have to hurt that person, I'm not going to stand in your way. Just, just come on. God. Here's the thing. When you first start praying for that person, it will most likely be through clenched teeth. But the more you pray, over time, you keep praying, and you keep praying, something will happen inside of you. What was once something you thought you could never do, pray for that person. You will discover that you can pray for that person. And then gradually and gracefully, God will lead you toward forgiveness. Which brings me to the last thing that I want to say to you this morning. And it comes from Colossians 3.13, which says this. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's said in Ephesians in a little different way. For Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. And to get at the root of, of this, this statement in the Bible, you, you got to go to Luke 23, 34. And the context of Luke 23, 34 is a hill outside of Jerusalem where there were three crosses. And on those three crosses hung two criminals and Jesus. On that day, the most horrible atrocities that could ever be inflicted upon another human being were thrown at Jesus. He had nails driven through his hands and through his feet, and he hung there on a cross. Now, a lot of us have an image of that cross, and we think that it was, it was kind of up in the air, and you walked up and you, could, you looked up. Most likely, the crosses, their feet were about this high off the ground. And so when a person hung there on that cross, you could almost look eyeball to eyeball with that person who's hanging on the cross, and that's exactly what happened. Jesus is hanging on the cross, and people would come. They'd spit in his face. They'd hurl all kinds of accusations and insults at him. So you think you're the king of the Jews and they just put him down and, and, and they, they abused him in ways that a human being should never be abused. And in the midst of all of that, he looked up to heaven and he said, 
Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's the greatest act of love that's ever been given by a human being. And so the call comes to us. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. But that person really did me wrong. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. But he cheated on me. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. But I shared with her some very personal stuff and she just put it all out on social media. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. But he stole from me. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. But he had an affair. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now I'll say something about that last one. If you're here this morning and you're dealing with an affair or the consequences of an affair, whether it's in, in your marriage or whether it's someone in your family that's dealing with that, when we all feel that pain, then there's a distinct possibility if you're dealing with an affair today that you have biblical grounds for divorce. But I heard this the other day, and it really struck me, especially in relation to this sermon this morning. And that is, while adultery is grounds for divorce for the believer, it's also grounds for forgiveness. You can choose the path of bitterness in response to whatever sin a person might have committed to you. You can choose bitterness. But I promise you this. You will never, ever be a whole person as long as bitterness is in your heart. Trust me, I know from personal experience. I mean, I agree with Anne Lamont. She, she said bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. <laughs> Bitterness is not the answer. Forgiveness is. And at some point, as you take those steps toward forgiveness, that Frozen song is going to come into play. Let it go. Right, Madeline? I mean, I mean if you choose to forgive, and you need to understand this, it's not going to change your past. It's not. If you choose to step into forgiveness, it will not undo all the pain and all the suffering that you've, been that you've been forced to endure because of that other person's sin against you. If you choose to forgive, it will not change your past, but hear this, it will change your future. I got an email this past week. Um, it was in response to the email that I sent out about this sermon. And uh, in this email, the person gave me permission to do whatever it is that I wanted to do with that email. So Chuck, I'm going to share your email. Got an email from Chuck Brueger. He said in his email, he said, I wanted to share what God did in my life 35 years ago with forgive us our trespasses. He said, I was a baby Christian about four to six weeks old. I'd never read the Bible in my life. I was driving from Hilltop Lakes on a back road to Normandy and I didn't know how to pray. So I was praying to our father and then I came to that part about forgive us. And when I got there, I stopped and I looked up to God Chuck said, and I said to God, are you telling me I need to forgive my dad? You gotta be kidding me. 
And God said, that's right. Chuck said, I, I said back to God, I can't do that. And God said, I know. I'll help you. Chuck said when he was young, he had been emotionally, physically, and sexually abused, as well as others in his family. So this was huge. So Chuck said, I made a deal with God that for 30 days, I would come to him and forgive my dad. 30 days. <laughs> After about four or five days, I was forgiven my dad, Chuck said, and I actually started laughing. He said, uh, I looked up to God and said, you know I'm lying. And God said, yes, Chuck, I know. And then Chuck said, I started crying so hard on that dirt road. And that day I forgave my dad. He said, Jerry, never once in all those years have I ever looked at my dad the same. I forgave him with God's power. And then Chuck says, by the way, I preached my dad's funeral 23 years later. And as I write this, my tears are tears of joy because of what God has done for me. You all know something's true? When you forgive, a prisoner is set free. And that prisoner is you. It's you. And it may be that that's the very blessing that God wants to give you today. So in a few minutes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing our closing song. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. And the invitation is to come home. Those of you who are weary, are you weary today? Maybe some of you are here today and you've been carrying the weight of unforgiveness for someone or for some people for a long, long time. And you've buried it. Or you carry it behind you. Or you carry it right here. Maybe today's the day that you say, I don't want to carry that anymore. And I understand it's not that easy. But maybe, maybe today's the day that you make a commitment to pray for that person and start that movement in your life toward forgiveness. I don't know. What it is the Lord may be inviting you to do today, but I suspect that he's inviting you to do something. And so in a moment when we sing, I'm going to pray, and then when we sing, I'm going to invite you to come to the altar, if you wish, and just spend some time with the Lord. Cast your burden on him. Cast your burden on him. Or maybe you want to stay where you are. I want to encourage you to take it to him. As I said at the beginning of this service, it's no accident that we're here today. I believe that there will be some who will leave this place today free. Free. It's already happened today. And I believe it will happen here.